My name is Adam Conrad, and what is my opinion on the 2024 municipal elections that just gone by, that just passed us? And I'm going to be truthful to you. I'm not going to hold back. I'm going to be very upfront with everybody here in this video. Let's just say I wasn't thrilled on what I seen, and I wasn't looking forward to it. Because, like, when I, one of the things I told some of the candidates running for, uh, mayor in person and in my videos here was that the word incompetent was hanging over Halifax Regional Council and even though that there's a, a more just more new faces added to Halifax Regional Council that still makes me wonder is this going to be enough to eliminate the word incompetent over Halifax Regional Council I'm unsure about it uh, the list of mayorly candidates, like I said before, I wasn't excited. I wasn't thrilled of what I seen. I wasn't interested in any of the candidates what I was looking at. I tell them I got more involved with the uh, mayor's election when I started hosting my own debate at the last moment, believe it or not. Uh, the reason for my mayor's debate at the last second was because, first of all, it was held at the Woodlawn Library. I can't host the event until they give me the room, until they give me the go-ahead. I gave them time for the mayor's debate to take place, but uh, they never told me that I had their room until something like three days before the election. And that was why everything was at the last second. I had uh, Riley Murphy attend my mayor's debate, and I had David Boyd, and we had a few people attend from the library. They would go down to the... To the uh, to the normal part of the library, then they would enter to the uh, auditorium where we were at, and that was we were hosting the mayor's debate. We had few people attend. Could have been a lot more if we had more time, but unfortunately, you know, it is what it is. And the beauty part is where we had the uh, mayor's debate at the Woodlawn Library. The woman who was responsible for booking the room, she said, Adam, due to the uh, status of the event, said, Adam, we're not going to send you a bill for this. We're going to give it to you for free. So that's something that you guys should consider who's running for mayor. Perhaps you could have a mayor's debate in Woodlawn Library in the auditorium where I had it. Uh, Way Mason looked at it, but unfortunately due to a last minute notice, there was no way that he could plan for it, which I understand. We had another mayor's uh, candidate who was going to come out, but he ain't broke his ankle due to a workplace injury. He was lucky. He said he was lucky that he could walk. So, all right, that's understandable. So we had two mayorly candidates. We almost had four. But, you know, it is what it is. But the debate went quite well. And if you're going to ask me between David, who was the, who won the debate between David Boyd and uh, Riley Murphy, I wasn't, ho I wasn't looking for a winner. I had no plans of announcing a winner. But I'll tell you my opinion. This is my opinion between David Boyd and Riley Murphy. David Boyd was a lot more experienced. David Boyd was a lot more experienced in how to handle these debates. David Boyd was more uh, experienced on how to come up with the answers, or, or he would know the answers before he got there, before questions were a or asked of him. But when it came to uh, Riley Murphy, he was the better speaker. He could present himself as a mayorly candidate. He looked as a mayorly candidate. And uh, one of the things that I got on the mayor, mayorly candidates during the 2024 municipal election was look presentable when you go out your campaign and when you attend these mayorly debates. Because if you don't, they're not going to take you seriously. You know, they're not going to they're not going to accept the reality that that person there is the candidate running for mayor if you don't look presentable. And candidates not looking presentable was something that I highly got after. I was always after on that. And uh, I understand that, you know, buying a suit can be a lot of money, you know. I can understand that. But that's just the way it is if you're running for mayor. It's just the way it is. But the one of the people that I took my hat off the most for the candidates was the guy who was living in those tents who felt that he had to get up, stand up, do the 
politics that's preventing people to have a roof over their head to bring change, to bring a stronger voice to City Hall. I don't know his name, but I take my hat off to him. God love him for doing what he did. And I got to say, it takes a lot to do that. And, uh, you know, for uh, a candidate to stand up for people and him them themselves live in a tent, that's brave. That's, that's, that's very admirable of him for doing what he did. It really is. But with the uh, Andy Fillmore thing, I mean... I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you something. I was shocked in what I seen with Andy Fillmore. Here's Andy Fillmore advertising his endorsements. Two of his endorsements caught my attention. Keith Caldwell and Peter Stoffer of all people. Keith Caldwell. Now, David Hensby knows what it's like when you gotta clash with Keith Caldwell, because he makes his politics quite personal, you know, if you're not with his beliefs or his political ways, he can be quite nasty. And not only that now, David, if you're listening, now I want to tell you something. I had a person from social media who I know, who lives in Clayton Park. He told me something, said, Adam, I'm going to tell you something. I had a brief clash with Keith Caldwell in Halifax. He said, just don't, he, 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 he said, he looked at him as if he's very cocky, that attitude, right? And, uh, and he said, he looked at Keith right back, because I guess they had a stare down and a stare down contest. He was going to win the stare down, and I guess Buddy of mine wasn't back down from Keith. And uh, and I said, unfortunately, I see, I, I know Keith at home and in the political field, but I said, I don't know Keith when he's away from the political scene when Keith is himself. And I said, at the most part, he, he's, he's an all right person. But if your politics clashes with him, he's, he's nasty. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I, I'd be concerned about if it gave him the nomination because in my opinion, I would consider him a threat to the very heart of democracy, put it this way. He'd be the threat that people like my grandfather Late grandfather went to World War Two. He was a, my grandfather was was a Second World War veteran, and he fought for the right for you to stand up to your politicians and voice your opinion. He calls against that stuff, especially if, if you flash out against his politics. And not only that, he was known for a clash with people in the community. Keith had a, had a fiasco with me in the community, and it basically caught Keith cost Keith his job. It was announced just before the last provincial election that Keith, he said he was going to rerun for another term for a community president. So Keith decided to have a big fiasco with me out in the community, and guess what happened? Ian Rankin revoked his, uh, his opportunity to rerun for the Nova Scotia Liberal Party, and that was the end of Keith Caldwell. In comes as Angela Simmons, takes his spot. They don't want... See, no political parties wants problematic people to the point they're causing concerns out in the community with, with, with their own community constituents and uh, out in the community. The party, the political parties don't want those people there. It's bad enough that these political parties got a bad enough name as it is. And that was uh, my, my issue with Key Cullo. And now my uh, second thing, what I said, what I noticed Peter Stoffer. And I said, here's Peter Stoffer, former member, member of parliament for Sackville in Eastern Shore. He was a member of Parliament from 1997, I believe, right to 2015 when he lost that fluke election to Daryl Sampson. Cause that's exactly what it was, a fluke election, because Daryl Sampson did not beat Peter Stoffer. Justin Trudeau beat Peter Stoffer, because uh, Daryl Sampson is just not member of Parliament worthy. And uh, Peter Stoffer is known for defending people that are low income, facing poverty, everything what the NDP stands for. So here's Peter Stoffer endorsing Andy Fillmore, who's just thrown gas on a fire, who's causing all kinds of uh, negativity of the community, from what I read on social media, because I, I never met Andy Fillmore myself personally, so. I'm only going by what I was told, so all right, so we get, so we get all this negativity, and here's Peter Stoffer backing him up. In my opinion, Peter Stoffer should have been out representing, endorsing, supporting Riley Murphy for the candidacy of mayor, because if uh, 
Riley Murphy had enough opportunities to uh, to uh, advertise himself during his campaign. I watched uh, Riley Murphy's numbers come in. They're pretty healthy. I've seen a lot of momentum there. And like I said, I've been involved with politics for pretty near 30 years. And I'll tell you something. I, I know good, strong talent coming down the line when I see it. And he's it. He just has that persona with him. And uh, with the thing with the CTV News Atlantic, CBC News Atlantic, and the St. Mary's University only bringing six out of the uh, 16 candidates, Maryland candidates, out to the debate, that's inconstitutional. I, I would support the candidates. I would encourage them to, 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 to join together and fall for a lawsuit against CTV News Atlantic, CBC News Atlantic, and St. Mary's University and sues them for damages that they caused to their campaign during the election. I said, maybe the, uh, the uh, Municipal Elections Act should have a law in place prohibiting the press for only bringing out half the merit of candidates out and not the full amount of candidates. Because if they were to say that they didn't have enough room for all the candidates, that's a load of crap. That's, that's the lazy way to get out of an excuse. The truth of the fact is, there's always room for everybody. you got to make the room. And I don't think that that commitment of making enough room for all 16 candidates was there. So if David Hensby was to come up and say, well, it wasn't enough, I'd say, David, sit down. But David Hensby and I talked about that on the phone, and he said what I did when I stood up to the press, when I did videos like this, standing up to the press, he said, Adam, you did the right thing by speaking or standing up for them. And, you know, I take my head off from David for uh, uh, noticing that, what I did. And uh, that's what Halifax Regional Council should be doing, addressing the uh, Municipal Hall the uh, Municipal Elections Act, prohibiting the press for uh, holding debates that doesn't include the full amount of candidates while attending these debates. It should be everybody, so everybody's welcome in. They're, e they're, they're treated as, as equally, not not different from others, and that's exactly what it was. And technically, you want to use the word discrimination, you could use that word in it. And uh, I wasn't happy in what I seen. I felt that was a load of crap. What we seen here was unconstitutional. Now, I'll get to the uh, District 2 election with David Hensby and Will Gilligan. Well, the writing's on the wall that the community District 2 is willing to vote David Hensby out. But I believe the reason to David Hensby's struggle to maintain District 2 in a victory was for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, I believe it was because of the uh, Porter's Lake sidewalk proposal that was slated for the uh, right in front of the uh, Porter's Lake shopping plaza. I believe that went right, was supposed to go down to the uh, pizza shop, the former villager pizza shop. Now, I believe it's the Big Wedge. Is that correct? The Big Wedge? Uh, I haven't seen the plans in quite some time. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. And uh, the concern that people had with those sidewalk proposals is because, A, nobody wanted them. B, there's just not enough pedestrian to, to movement to support sidewalks in the first place. There's people walking on the side of the road, but it's not enough that you need to consider... Uh, sidewalks, but there is enough pedest pedestrian movement to install side uh, crosswalks, because, I mean, I don't know how many near hits, car accidents, near death experiences that almost happened there because sidewalks was not installed in that location. But what I had mentioned to David Hensby, what he started campaigning with, I guess you could say, started up advocating about. I said, David, why don't you guys do what they did in Sheet Harbor? Sheet Harbor has the less pedestrian movement in the community of Sheet Harbor, but yet they have sidewalks. And the people up in Porters Lake during their January meeting stated, well, how did Sheet Harbor get sidewalks? And they got less people. And David Hensby got up and stated that the community of Sheet Harbor had had a private sponsor's uh, what did you call them there? Uh, you know, people there that uh, groups of uh, individuals that paid private 
sponsors that paid for those sidewalks to be installed. And I told David, I said, well, why don't you do this, why don't you make the proposal, but do the same thing for Porter's Lake, but the private side of things will pay for it instead of the taxpayers. And I mentioned that to a family member, and she agreed. I said, all right. But, like I said, all right, so let's just say the private sector, uh, said they don't want it no more. So who's going to build the, the, the maintain the sidewalks? My suggestion was, well, send the province in and with the rescue of it or tear up the sidewalks and go back to the old curb and that will be that. It was an all right uh, proposal. But in my opinion, for the sidewalk debate discussion to be, the proposal, I should say, that came up was because, in my opinion, it was law laws. It was the entire Porters Lake Shopping Plaza location in that district that wanted sidewalks. Not the people, not the community residents, the shopping plaza. And like I told David, hey, if they want it, let them pay for it. Who cares? If they're willing to pay for the, the maintenance and all this stuff, heck, they will let them name the sidewalks if, 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 if they want to. But don't go to the taxpayer to pay for this reinstallation. Don't be trying to bump our community to a different area rate because a private sector wants to pay for sidewalks. And then the other issue was uh, amalgamation. A lot of people at the Muscadelva Harbor Councilors debate had said the word amalgamation that was done illegally against the people's will when they didn't even have a say to have it was done without them having a say. And and then he said it's clearly shown that the Eastern Shore communities are not faring very well or at all at this amalgamation. And uh, the community of Porter's Lake shown us some signs, but not much. But the only but see, the concerns with amalgamation is all that's doing is raising taxes, making it unaffordable and unlivable for people to live in. People have been working, they lost their uh, pension, they're, they lost a lot of money off their pensions. They set them back for the next 10, 15 years off their pensions because they lost the majority of their pensions when amalgamation came to effect. And some people stated where amalgamation was just because the Halifax police and the firefighters wanted more money for their pensions. Had a good argument there. And uh, basically what, uh, what was her name? Pam Lovelace has stated, now David Hensley will remember this, and I don't remember the name of the council, what she suggested. She, she suggested separate the Eastern Shore communities, Hubbards, some of Sackville, even Enfield, and even uh, Eastern Passage, and form another municipality, but still be part of the Halifax region and have a, a different kind of Halifax Regional Council, but it's separate from the regular council. Oh, we know it. It goes that route. So we're in a lot lower tax bracket. Everything's a lot cheaper, and so it's more affordable. So it's so it's more reasonable for people. And I now I, I would have to agree with that, but people should be able to vote on that motion if that was to happen. Let's not repeat the same old problems with ju what the uh, Liberal Party did back in 1996 when the amalgamation was brought to effect. But a lot of people put a lot of anger in the direction of John Savage for that, Mike Savage's father. And now here's the truth about the amalgamation. When amalgamation went to was before it went to effect, Paul Buchanan's conservatives was going to do it before John Savage did it. So they can curse and swear and blame the late John Savage for amalgamation, but really the conservatives were going to do it actually before when John Savage did it. So in a way, you see people hollering at John Savage, but they keep re-electing the Tories when the Tories is the one who actually originally came up with that idea. And uh, during this municipal election, majority of the topics that were coming up were all provincial jurisdiction issues. And that just proves to show that Tim Houston's conservative government is not doing a very good job of looking after the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, my concern is with Tim Houston, with the Nova Scotia government political politics, is that you look at uh, Zach Churchill, leader of the Nova Scotia Liberal Party. He's not premier worthy. And, and here's a liberal still kicking around as leader of the party instead of finding a new leader. The NDP got Claudia Chandler. Chances she's never going to get, she, she'll never be premier. She, she, she's just not premier material. So 
So that just leaves Tim Houston open for re-election. So there's the door wide open. And here's my MLA, Kent Smith. He burnt about 90% of his bridges with his own constituents already. He's despised. People can't stand the sight of him. And David Hemp even knows that, too. Because Kent knows he's not going to my door, because if he does, he's in big trouble. If he goes to my door, you know, he's going to be showing the door real fast. Well, actually, Kent Smith's not allowed to step on my, on my property because my lawyer made it clear that he's not welcome on our, on our, on our property. Because me and Kent actually had a... Had a we had a, a legal dispute. Basically, my lawyer confronted Kent Smith, who basically, we're going to sue you if, there's any, if you continue with your allegations. We're going to sue him and his secretary. Uh, what's his name? Kelly Corkley? I never heard from them since. I don't want to hear from them ever again. There's nothing good about them. But my concern is, now David Hensby had made the announcement that this is going to be his last term for running for council. This is my concern. There's nobody to replace him that's decent. You find these complete idiots from Muscadelva Harbor, this complete arsehole from uh, Jador, who has no knowledge, no nothing, because Will Gilligan I th is was a good guy, but he was just saying yes to everything. Yes, 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 yes. That's all he did was say yes. But he never had no plans, and uh, he wanted to make all walking trails share with ATVs and pedestrians. You can't have have it that way, because some people they'll they'll misuse the trails. Have you seen what happened in West Chesuncook? During that Blueberry Trail run, I mean, the ATV Rider Club, is that what they're called? Is that what they're called, David? Uh, is it the Blueberry Trail Rider Club? I don't know, but anyways. They've been cracking down on the wrong people, been, at, been using access to that walking trail that's owned by the province, but the ATV Rider Club maintains it. Is that correct, David? And, uh... Concern is when the wrong people access the, these trails, they're destroying the whole thing. They're 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 going on people's property when they shouldn't be there. People get mad. Uh, there was an issue down the uh, Blueberry Trail run in uh, Grand Desert. Somebody was using back the trail around what was it, ten o'clock at night when people had to had to get up be work for get to get up for work at five o'clock in the morning. I mean. Idiots like that. That why would you go back the trail ten o'clock at night on a weekday for what? What the hell's wrong with these people? But those are the concerns about uh, having a shared trail. I think, you know, it should be a walking trail only. But when you have a walking trail on, only, so now the, the concern, the question is, so where do the people go with these ATVs? They can't, they, they can't go too far on them. This is my opinion, in my opinion only. The province, the only time when skidoos, ATVs, should be allowed on the road is during emergency situations only. Like if it's a massive snowstorm, you got to get by your car can because because the roads are too dangerous to be on. Because we all know what the province is like. And the well, the province mostly when it comes to uh, snow removal, clearing the roads, they take forever because they're on the main highways first, then they go to the side roads later. It takes them too long to get the roads clear for people to be ready for work in the morning. And I say, if there's an emergency situation on a snowstorm, or somebody got to get to or from wherever on an ATV, and I don't take the ATV on the road. But not during the average day, because I like to see if the ATVs were to be uh, legal to be on the road, I want to make sure that they give off enough lighting at night so they can see pedestrians when they're walking at night so they're not running into people and causing fatalities. And what can the DNR do to better combat ATV all-terrain vehicles on the road when they're not supposed to be there? You know, so, so we got to think of how we can make things safe before we let them access the roads, basically. But this municipal election, I'm concerned that the word incompetence is still going to be hanging over regional council. I don't believe Andy Fillmore is the right person to be mayor. Because uh, when Mike Savage was mayor, my concern was all he had was a millionaire 
as mayor, and I said, well, if Mike Savage, you know, he got no sense of reality, and uh, if Mike Savage is a millionaire, what, which he is, I said, how is Mike Savage exposed to mentally? He had grip to the reality of how to address affordable housing, poverty, not being able to put food on the table, not being able to uh, feed themselves, let alone feed their families. I mean, that re- that mental mortality is something that Mike Savage just can't grip to because he never faced it himself. He never encountered it. He needed a mayor who had been through the trenches, who had been through the stuff, someone like Riley Murphy, great, talented person. In my opinion, this is my opinion, if Riley Murphy had enough equal opportunity to campaign that he should have, I believe Riley Murphy could have been either second or third place, if not the mayor-elect. I could see that happening. But after when I seen the corruption and the, this and the, and the, and the political horseshit taking place again in politics, Ian, what's his name? Andy Fillmore elected as mayor. And like I said, I got nothing against Andy Fillmore. I don't know him. I never met him. But I'm just saying in my opinion, unfortunately for Andy, I don't believe he's the right person to be mayor. You need somebody who went through the trenches and know what it was like. But the thing with uh, Jordan in this election, I noticed uh, one of the mayor candidates was uh, protesting that he lost the election. That was David Boyd. I know him for for a while, and uh, I know him since 2004. Now I don't know how long he have been involved in politics. I mean, how long he'd been running politics? I should say only he probably knows that because I, you know, I don't really know myself. But if you know, if he was upset, you know, this is a part where he take he got to accept the responsibility of his own losses because he wasn't dressed. A merely presentable to be knocking on doors. You got these old rough jackets and all this stuff. Good guy, great approachable person and all this stuff, but he got to save some money somehow and buy a suit and go door to door. Uh, he asked me to be his campaign manager, which I had agreed, but unfortunately, as luck would have it, about two weeks or a week before the uh, election had started, I sustained an injury. I tore my back out. I couldn't walk. I was lucky I could stand up. I was in pain. I heard I pinched a nerve in my back where my hip is, and I re- and a retired nurse looked at me. She said, Adam, usually when you pinch a nerve in that spot, usually you're out for about a month. And here you are a week and a half later walking around, pain-free pretty well. And she said, you're very fortunate here. And when I came around, uh, the election was midway through, but I said, I'm not going to get involved in this missile election like I did in the past with Peter Kelly, Mike Savage, and David Hensby in the past. I said, I'm not going to get involved with any of them. I'm just going to do what I'm doing here, and I'll host the odd mayor's event, uh, debate, which I did. But other than that, that's as much as I'm going to do because I said, I'm hurt. I'm just going to go with the flow, and I think I was probably the only... Uh, person involved in politics who didn't take part, but yet you can still show yourself that you're still active in the elections, even though that you were hurt. And that's what I did. And that's why you didn't see me with no mayorly candidates, no council members putting up signs because I was home. I was hurt. I was. I was lucky that I could get dressed in the morning. It was that bad. Actually, my opinion, home care should have come at my door trying to get you dressed and you know, get you to walk again and all this stuff, but I did it on my own. I took some medications, you know, one step at a time, I got going again. But it was a very painful experience, let's just put it that way. But this uh, mayor's debate, I wasn't interested in any of the candidates. Uh, Riley Murphy was a great, strong, solid candidate that I noticed. Great, talented political candidate. I think uh, Ronnie Murphy should watch the 2028 municipal election, but also that, I, if I was him, I'd look at the uh, a nomination for a political party and look at running provincial or even federally for that fact. But other than that, those were my concerns with the uh, 2004 municipal election, but the thing with David Boyd, like I said, you got to go buy a suit and all this stuff. 
there comes a, a time when a person when they've been running so long for office they're gonna come to a this to a to the reality that they're not gonna elect you it's time to move on in my opinion I think that's something what Amy Boyd should be considering never mind uh, saying there's a rigged election all that stuff which it was but the only way it's people like David Boyd and the other Maryland candidates are gonna really bring that to an end with the press is if they sue them so it's either you Join together with the candidates, come up with the money, you sue CTV News Atlantic, CBC Atlantic, you sue St. Mary's University, one lawsuit, which you can do by law. And I really can't see a judge denying that kind of a lawsuit. I could actually see, I, if I was a judge, I'd approve that. And when those three parties are sued, when they're paying out on damages, trust me when I tell you this, they're going to think twice before they have a, another debate like that again when they're, this, uh, when they're not inviting the, the entire candidates to the debate, trust me. I'm mean, I tell you this, trust me. People play play it tough, but they're really not that tough when it, when the chips are down. Put it that way. But uh, other than that, yeah, I'm just hoping that council's gonna turn around for the for the better. Uh, do we still got time? I will talk about one more thing before we go off here. Uh, I was talking to David Hensby here uh, today. I told him about I had a relative at home that has no access to her legs, arms. Her hands, there's no coordination, you know, it's, it's coordination, not very good how, how our coordination is. And uh, she applied for uh, for the access wheelchair buses because she's confined to a wheelchair. And uh, she applied for the uh, for the application to apply for the uh, access wheelchair bus. They denied her because she lives in Porter's Lake. Now, David Hinsby was a little concerned about that because I said, well, David, the only way, well, go to her door and look at her. Look, says, well. She only can stand up for about two minutes. You're going to sit down again. It's like a disorder where you have like a stroke, but your body only comes like 50% of the full 100 where you were at. Basically, that's what, basically what happened. I said, well, she can, they can call, but here's the thing. Her hands are no coordination. She's hitting the wrong phone numbers, and she's lucky that, she, that they could ever answer the phone and say hello on the phone, put it that way. So basically what I told David is, why don't you do this? You make a date and time to meet. You call me. You tell me the date and time to be at her house because she can't drive or nothing like that. And I'll tell her when to be ready. That's the best you can do. And I said, uh, my opinion what happened was where she can't re uh, write because of her hands, there's no coordination. I believe the person who filled out the application might have filled it out wrong because I never actually seen the application. But she does have the letter of denial from the Halifax Transit Access Wheelchair Bus, so I basically told her, David's probably going to appeal it for you, and you're probably going to, you're likely going to get that, 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 that service, but if Halifax Transit is saying, no, no, we don't go to Porter's Lake, they'll be going to your door, trust me, because that's the problem with amalgamation, see, Halifax Transit, when they go out to the eastern shore of Porter's Lake, to them, that's the, that's the end of the earth, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just forbidden, that's, that's the ultimate sacrilege, they don't want to go that far, that's the sacrilege there. And, you know, Porter's Lake is only, what, 15, 20 minutes outside of Dartmouth, not very far away. So I think the attitude of Halifax Transit serving communities of the Halifax region has to change. It's either you're going to serve the communities of Halifax or we're going to find another bus service that's going to serve them for you. So what's it going to be? Or do we got to find a new driver? So so anyways, David, you heard that, and so did the members of Halifax Council. So it's not too good here. So anyways... I'm Adam Conrad, and uh, you heard my uh, concerns with the 2024 municipal election.